So to start off uh, today's video, you guys heard the latest statistics joke? You probably have. Okay, what we're going to be taking a look at today is probability. Uh, what we're going to be doing in the next, uh, likely in the next two videos, we're going to start off with our initial definitions and some basic counting rules. What exactly do counting rules mean? Well, you're right, usually you start at one, move on to two, on and on. Okay, I'm just full. Uh, no, what we're meaning by counting rules, these are going to be ways that we can work out kind of how many outcomes exist, little tricks that we can utilize to make this a lot easier than trying to count through a large possible scenarios. So that'll be this video. We'll take a look at definitions and counting rules. In the next video on probability, we will take a look at probability itself and a bunch of different ways we can calculate and utilize probability. So let's try to keep the puns aside the best we can, and we'll carry on. So to start off, one of the first things we're going to be doing is we need to define probability itself. So probability is the likelihood of a situation occurring. And what we would say is that in the way we're going to be using it, probability will be bounded between 0 and 1. So in each extreme, zero is something that would never happen. One would be our absolute certainty, right? So something that is assigned a probability of zero, there's, there's no chance we would have witnessed this. Something that's assigned a probability of one, it will occur with certainty. In between zero and one, well, we're going to have a range of possible values, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.666, right? All of these different kind of options available showing us the likelihood of a certain um, situation, outcome, event actually coming to realization. Keep in mind, when we're talking about probability like this, we're, re we're referring to it as 0 to 1. We could very easily refer to this, and often we will refer to it between 0 and 100%. Keeping in mind that, okay, 0 to 100% is, well, 100% is 1, 0% is 0. Right, in the very the same way, we could have 50%, we could have that guy being reported as 0 0.50. So we can report probabilities in these kind of ways here. We can also take a look at another way of expressing these, and this is with our odds. And so for odds, what we're looking at, odds are often used in betting or in a sports situations, so usually because of betting. And the way that we would express odds typically is we would express this as number of successes to number of failures. So in this case here, let's pretend that we are rolling a dice, right? And this is something that even without any formal bit of going into probability, we should be able to work through. So let's suppose that we roll a dice, right? So that's a six-sided dice. And we want to presume, we want to figure out, hey, what is the probability that on this six-sided dice, I roll a five? Well, okay, hopefully that's pretty straightforward to most of you. You want to know the probability we roll a five on a six-sided dice? Every possible outcome has the same probability of occurring. It's a random dice. So prob probability we roll a five would be one out of six, right? One out of six, well, okay, that's just a fraction. We could express that as our decimal. That's going to be 0 0.1666666, so we'll say 0 0.167. Or there's a 16.7% chance that I roll a five. So we can work that out and express it as our traditional kind of probability. But what if I wanted to express this as an odds, right? So in this case here, with my odds, I want my number of successes to my number of failures. So, okay, keep in mind when I roll a dice, there's six possible results that I could witness. Out of them, if I want to know, hey, what are the odds that I roll a five? So, what are the odds of a five? Well, I would have one success. And then out of those six possible results that I could have, five of them would be failures. So I would have one success to five failures, or I'd have one to five odds. So I could work out odds, or I could work out probabilities. And we can work back and forth. We can transition one to the other. 
That is, if I wanted to say, okay, well, one to five odds, well, what does that mean in terms of probability? Well, I could bring this back. I could go one over one plus five. That's one over six. That is, okay, what, what have I just done? I've done number of successes divided by total number of results. So number of successes plus number of failures. And that gave me 1 over 6, or 0 0.167, the probability we worked out up here. So we have our idea of probability, at least. Let's take a look at some other basic definitions that we'll need as we carry on through this chapter. So one of the, I shouldn't say one of, three of the big definitions that we're going to be taking a look at and we'll be using as we carry on. We'll have x experiment will have an outcome and we will have an event and let's take a look at each of these so let's kind of define these let's work out what they are an experiment well an experiment is just undertaking some action that's going to result in a random variable or a random result random outcome is really what that's going to be so is going to be, let's say, an action with a random result. That is what we can kind of do, kind of our layman's, our layman's kind of definition for experiment. And so something like rolling the dice, that would be an experiment, right? We don't know what the result of that's going to be. It's going to give us some value between one and six. Conducting a survey, that could be an experiment, right? Every survey we hand out would be a new experiment. We don't know how the survey, uh, surveyor, surveyee, surveyee, we're not sure how that surveyee is going to fill out the survey and what results we're going to have. So it'd be random in that case there. So experiment is just going to be some action undertaken that's going to give us some random results. The outcome then, that is all of those possible random results. So when we roll the dice, right, our outcomes in that case where we could have rolled a one, two, three, four, five, or six, right? If we we're picking uh, cards from a deck of cards, we could have had an ace of jack, jack of ace. Oh, I'm not talking very well today. We could have had a two of hearts. We could have had right on and on and on and on. An outcome is just all the possible all the possible results from our trial or experiment. So outcomes, just everything that we could possibly witness. An event then, this is our last one, an event is going to be one or more outcomes of interest. Right, so the event is what we're actually interested in studying. That is, maybe we want to know, hey, what is the probability of rolling a five, right, on a six-sided dice? And right, we already looked at that. We said, okay, great, one out of six. We can work that guy out pretty readily. Well, okay, that's just one outcome, right? Rolling a five, that was just one of these outcomes. But I could also have an event being, hey, what's the probability of rolling an even number. Well, okay, in this case here, probability of rolling an even number, so that's rolling a two, rolling a four, rolling a six. Well, okay, that would be three successes to three failures, if we want to think about it in our sense of our odds, or three out of six, one half. We could work that guy out too. And again, right, even without any real formal training, formal discussion on how we calculate probabilities, we're already able to work through this a bit. So an event is just one or more of these outcomes. In our first example here, it was just, just the one outcome of interest. In our second example, we were grouping our outcomes together to create the event of interest. So we have our three kind of bits here. Experiment, sometimes we'll refer to these as trials. Outcome, all the possible results and then event, the outcomes of interest. Let's take our look at our next bit. Let's take a look at a few different types of probability and the ones that we're gonna be playing around with.
So for types of probability, there's going to be two kind of big groupings. We're going to have objective. So these are types of probabilities that can be measured, can be determined, and quite readily, this will be our focus. The other side is going to be subjective probabilities. These are often interested, but we're not going to be focusing on these during our course at all. These are going to be cases like, well, when they record something like, hey, there is a 32 to 4 odds that the Oilers will win the Stanley Cup. There is a 60% chance that the NDP will reform government following this fall's election. Right? All of these are subjective probabilities. That is, we cannot run an experiment. We cannot do repeated trials. We can't just say, well, hey, there's six possible outcomes on our dice. One of them is a success, one in six. Right? We cannot test these. So as a result, these odds or these probabilities, keeping in mind, right, we can move back and forth between the two. Those are not necessarily equal, but we could move back and forth between the two. These are subjective. We're using other outside information in order to come up with these values. Our focus, our focus is going to be objective probability, and objective probability is what we're going to be looking at measuring. Underneath objective probability, objective, we're going to have two types. We're going to have our classical probability. And we're going to have our empirical probability. So two types of probability to consider in this case here. Let's take a look at each one. Let's start off with our classical. So classical probability. What's this? Well, our classical probability, this here, this was, really came about in our uh, 17th century. And what's going on with this here? Well, our classical probability is getting at, well, let's, let's list our assumption first. The first assumption, we have to assume, we have to assume that in this case here, classical probability, that all outcomes, so right, we took a look what outcomes means, that's all possible results, all outcomes are equally as likely. That is, when we roll a dice, we are just as likely to roll a 3 as we are to roll a 6. If we're pulling cards out of a deck of cards, we're just as likely to pull out something that's a hearts as we are to pull out something that is a spades. We should also attach onto this, right? So far I've just said, hey, assume all outcomes are equally as likely. I should actually say all outcomes are known. And equally as likely. That is for a classical probability, we need to know what all of our outcomes are. And then, okay, how do we use classical probability? Well, this here, this is really just getting back to our games of chance. We don't need to run experiments, we don't need to run trials in order to figure out what these probabilities are. Because we have these assumptions that, okay, all outcomes are known, all outcomes are equally as likely. I can work out my classical probability, so probability of some event A, that's just going to be all together, well, how many favorable, how many favorable outcomes do I have? So when we roll the dice, if event A was rolling an even number, well, how many favorable outcomes do I have? Rolling a six-sided dice, I would have two, four, six. So I would have three favorable outcomes. And then I would take my number of favorable outcomes and I would divide it by my total outcomes. So how many outcomes are there all together? Well, we have one, two, three, four, five, and six. So, hey, we didn't even have to run an experiment. We didn't even have to roll a dice a whole bunch of times to figure this out. We can just think about it and we can say, hey, yeah, yeah, probability of A, that is my probability of rolling an even number, that's just 3 out of 6 or 
percent. And I have my classical probabilities. So there we go, not so bad. These are what we use in our games of chance, these kind of situations. Uh, if you're trying to analyze your probability of a certain outcome in gambling or these kind of situations there. A few other kind of definitions that we want to take a look at in order to better define this. And we'll come back to talk about empirical. These will apply to both. These two uh, definitions we need are going to be mutually exclusive. And that is for an event to be mutually exclusive. It means that if we've witnessed one event, it excludes the possibility of witnessing another. So the best way to think of mutually exclusive events is think about flipping a coin. Flipping a coin. So what are, what are the outcomes here? Our outcomes of a fair coin toss are we either get heads or we get tails. One or the other, H or T, heads or tails. Now, these two outcomes, these two events, right, in this case, I can use them interchangeably because, hey, my event is one or more outcome and head, one of my events or outcomes I'm interested in versus tails, the other one I'd be interested in. So if I witness a head, so I flip, I get heads. Well, could I witness, there we go, boom, I have heads up. Could I also witness the tails at the same time? No, right? By witnessing heads, we have precluded the possibility of witnessing a tails. We've negated that. That cannot happen. So in this case here, this experiment of flipping a coin has two mutually exclusive outcomes. When we witness heads, we cannot witness tails. Same thing with rolling our dice. If we witness a two, we cannot witness a five, right? They are mutually exclusive. We only have one value facing up. You cannot witness more than one. So one outcome has excluded another outcome. These are mutually exclusive. Another definition we need to keep in mind is in this case here, when we're working through classical probability, especially, what we need is that we need all of our outcomes to be collectively exhaustive. And what do we mean by collectively exhaustive? Well, collectively exhaustive, what this is getting at is that collectively, all of our outcomes here have exhausted all possible outcomes, right? We don't have anything that we've missed. We don't have anything that was not listed. All possible outcomes have been accounted for. All possible outcomes have been listed. So collectively exhaustive means that everything has been considered. Everything that could happen, all of our results that could occur, have been accounted for. So two definitions that we'll be utilizing going forward. Okay, let's, uh, let's go and bring this empirical probability down. Empirical probability, and let's go take a look at that guy. So, what's going on with this case? Empirical probability, what are we doing? In the case of empirical probability, we are running repeated experiments or trials, right? Kind of use those interchangeably. And what we would do is we would conduct this experiment, we would conduct this trial, and we would record the result. We would then do this again, and we'd record the result. And again, and again, right, on and on and on. We would continually run these experiments, these trials, recording the result each time. And then what we would do at the end is we would work out our probability for some event A, that would be worked out to be our number of times that A occurred versus our number of 
trials. Right, so in this case here, okay, how many times did we witness a successful observation versus how many trials did we do all together? In order for this to work, in order for us to be able to utilize empirical probabilities, we need to appeal to the law of large numbers. And what appealing to the law of large numbers really means is that we have to run enough trials for this empirical probability to converge to the true probability. So, okay, if we think about this, if we go back to just flipping a coin, if we go back to flipping a coin, if I flip a coin, right, so trial, outcome, if I flip a coin once and I get, boom, heads, and I just walk away and say, hey, look at that, probability of heads is occurred once over one trial. Wow, I have one or 100% probability of witnessing heads? No, right? That, that, that makes no sense. Even if, say, we did something like this, we did, hey, trial two, and I also got heads. And then trial three, oh, there we go, I have tails now. Well, could I go and take this and now say, okay, probability of getting heads is, well, I witnessed two successes out of three trials, giving me 66.7% probability of witnessing a heads? No, right, again, not large enough in our number of trials, right? Maybe, maybe after we've run a hundred trials, maybe now, once we run this, we get something that works out to be something like 0 0.5011, right? Actually, really, how would that work with a hundred trials? Maybe let's say this is a thousand trials. That would make a bit more sense. There we go. Probability of heads is something around 0 0.5011. Well, now we'd have a pretty good idea as to what our probability of heads is converging to. Likely, as we backed up our trials, right, if this was our probability of heads on the thousandth trial, if we backed up to our, say, 950th, maybe we had something like this, 0 0.4986, right, and we see, oh, hey, we're kind of getting close to one number. Maybe if we backed it up a bit more, we had something like 0 0.502. And we say, hey, we're kind of hovering around this 0 0.5 mark. Sometimes we're going a little bit below. Sometimes we're going a little bit above. But we appear to be converging to a value. Well, we can then take this and we can say that, okay, likely our probability of getting ahead is 0 0.5. And now you're looking at this and you're like, oh, Keith, I really hope you don't have us flipping a coin a thousand times to prove that, hey, probability of getting heads is 50%. No, 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 we're not doing that. Don't worry. We're not going to be that cruel or unusual. Really what we're getting at here is just that we can calculate probabilities if we have large enough repeated trials. That is, we would refer to this often as a large enough sample, right? Every sample, every observation we've pulled out, that's a trial. That's a, an experiment. The result of that pulling that individual out is going to be a random variable that is part of that. So if we have a large enough sample, if we have a large enough number of trials, we can work out the number of times that we had our successful result, that is the probability of the event we were looking at, versus the total number of trials we had conducted. And that can give us, appealing to the law of large numbers, that will give us our probability of success. Let's take a look at an example of this. Let's take a look at an example. Okay, so every year, um, BC, they conduct a survey on the outcomes of their student graduates. So looking back to the 2014 BC uh, survey, they surveyed probably tens of thousands of students, but we only had, uh, what do we have here? We only had 883 students responding to the survey. Of this, what did we have? We had 5,507 being female, 7,551 had found full-time employment, and 7,022 
had found employment in a field related to their study. So, okay, based off of that information, we have a few questions. First question, what is the probability that in 2014 a graduate was male? Well, okay, what did we have? We had our number of trials. What do we have for our total number of trials, total number of experiments conducted? We had 800 and, sorry, 800, 8,883. I guess kind of another good question to throw into here. What type of probability are we going to utilize in asking, or rather solving questions one and two? Are we going to solve these guys using classical? Or are we going to solve these guys using empirical probabilities? Well, in this case here, we're going to be using empirical probabilities. The reason why we're using empirical probabilities is we cannot make the assumption that all outcomes are equally as likely, right? We can't say that, hey, it's just as likely that both males and females graduate from university college. We cannot say that it's just as likely that males and females had found employment or that students had found employment or their study, right? All of this here, there's a lot of, eh, we don't know how these outcomes are actually distributed. So we can't make that assumption, but hey, we do have a large number of trials being conducted. So what we can do is appeal to this law of large numbers and utilize an empirical probability. So, okay, we have 8,883 trials, experiments conducted. We had uh, 5,507 students responding that they were female. But, okay, what are we looking for? We're looking for probability male. So what would that be? Number male all over total number of trials, 8,883. How are we going to get this value? Well, if we have 5,507 females and 8,883 altogether being surveyed, well, what's the leftover? That leftover there is going to be three thousand three hundred and seventy six male, right? And okay, where, where did we get that? Did we just jump over that? Total number of trials minus number that were female, and that gave us our three thousand three hundred and seventy six, right? In this case here, because these two events are mutually exclusive. One or the other, the two together make up our entire observations, all of our trials, so we can difference them and get the number of male. So working that out then, 3376 all over 8883, give us a probability of any graduate being male to be uh, about 38%. So that is, in 2014, only about 38% of graduates were male. What else are we looking for? What is the probability that a 2014 graduate found a full-time job? So, okay, same kind of idea. Probability that they are working full-time. That's going to be number who had found a full-time job versus total number. So what's number that have found a full-time job? Um, 7,551 had found full-time employment. So 7,551 over 8,883. What does that give us? That gives us, oh, wow. 85%, uh, yep, yeah, 85% of our graduates in 2014 had found full-time employment. So here we have our quick example of using our empirical probabilities and working out, okay, given a large number of trials, a large number of experiments being run, 8,883 surveys, we can look at our number of successes for the event of interest and then work out the corresponding empirical probability. So example as to how we can do that. Okay, next here we're going to take a look at counting rules. 
Um, as we've seen with our classical probabilities, but in other cases as well, we need to work out how many possible outcomes may exist in order to get a collectively exhaustive list of outcomes. Sometimes this is pretty simple, right? When we were trying to work out, hey, how many possible outcomes exist when we flip a coin? How many possible outcomes exist when we roll a dice? It was just counting. It was pretty straightforward. But that's not always the case. So what we're going to introduce is a bunch of rules that will help us to be able to work out the total number of possible outcomes. And the first one here is going to be our rules of arrangement, or I guess not rules of arrangement, rather um, number of arrangements. And the way that we can think about this is, let's say that we're going out for lunch. And you're looking at the menu, and there are altogether four different sandwich options. So you can pick of one of four sandwiches. Each of these sandwiches, well, is available in two sizes. You can either get it as, let's say, a 6-inch or a 12-inch. So, okay, four sandwiches in two sizes. As well, your sandwich is going to be paired with a drink. You have three different drink options. So, three drinks to choose from, of which these can be paired with, or not paired with, sorry, are available in either small, medium, or large. What we want to work out is how many possible different ways are there for you to order lunch, right? And how many different possible outcomes exist in this case. Keep in mind, right, we couldn't actually really do a classical probability case in this because that would need the assumption that all of those outcomes were equally as likely to be chosen. And that's not necessarily the case. So we're just using this to kind of say, okay, how many outcomes could there be? Well, using our number of arrangements, uh, this is often also known as our multiplication formula, not our multiplication rule, that's different, we'll get that next video, but in our multiplication formula here, we can determine our number of outcomes or our number of arrangements as O times P, or if we want to, if we need to keep going, times Q, times R, times S, on, on, on what we need. So, okay, what, what's going on here? Well, in this case here, what do we have? Well, we have four sandwiches, two options. So, okay, we have four sandwiches available in two options. We have three drinks available in three different sizes. Using all of this information, then, we can work out our total number of arrangements or our total number of outcomes that are possible to order lunch and much quicker than if we tried to count through all of these possible situations. So what do we have? Three times three is nine, nine times two is 18, 18 times four is going to be 72. So there's 72 different possible ways that I can order this lunch. And our rules of arrangement, our, our multiplication formula, is a good, easy way that we can work this out. So this is our first kind of counting rule, our first counting formula we can utilize in order to figure out number of outcomes. And in fact, what we'll look at next is actually going to be derived upon this multiplication formula. So let's take a look at our next one. Our next one is known as a permutation. And maybe you remember permutations from high school math. What permutations are looking at is how many outcomes, so number of outcomes, if the order, order matters. That is, for a permutation, it is saying that if we, I don't know, let's use an example. We had a bag here, and inside this bag was a whole bunch of M&Ms of different colors. And you reached in to the bag, and you grabbed three M&Ms, and you pulled out a blue one, a red one, and a yellow one. But right, you just grabbed in, you closed your hand on three of them, and you turned around and opened your hand. And there you go, that's what you saw. What a permutation is saying is that order matters. That is, the permutation would be saying, hey, this here, blue, red, yellow, 
that is not the same as reaching in and having a yellow, a red, and a blue. A permutation would say that the order that things appear is important. And so, yes, you have the same three colors in both cases, but they're in different orders. So, okay, we would say that in this case, if we're like, well, no, 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 these are the same things. Who cares about the order? Well, okay, if we don't care about the order, what we're actually interested in is a combination. So two different terms. Permutation says the order is important. Permutation says these two scenarios are different. A combination says, no, 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 order is not important. It's just what we have when we open up our hand, meaning that our combination would say that these guys are actually the same, right? That is, we go and we get that. It would be saying, okay, that'd be the exact same as if we opened up our hand and got this one. Uh, what other color did I use? I used red. There we go. Right, they would say those two are the same even though they're in different orders. So, order does not matter, permutation order matters. So, this actually brings up an interesting problem, and the problem comes with the way that we often refer to things in the world around us. That is, right, anybody ever have, let me see, let me see if I can draw this. Anybody ever have one of these kind of Let's see, can you guys figure out what I'm drawing here? One of these kind of locks has 60 numbers going around the outside, and you have to turn the dial, you have to put in, let's say that your code here was something like 63, 42, and 5. Well, the problem is, and this is where people often get mixed up and confused, is that we call these a combination lock. Combination lock. This is often how you'll refer to these called. In fact, you'll actually see them marketed as combination locks. But that's a lie. This is absolutely a lie. These are not combination locks. If they were a combination lock, even though this is your code, 63425-5, well, if I went to your lock and I put in 5, 63, 42, well, the lock would also open. It would say, great, those are the same because it's the same numbers and order doesn't matter, right? Combination, order does not matter. So, okay, yes, we typically call these combination locks. Yes, that's the way we typically think about them. It's a lie, it's not true, they're not combination locks. What are they then? Well, these guys here technically would be a permutation lock because the order in which you put your code in matters. So slowly, one video, one semester at a time, we'll change the entire English language, we'll get people to referring these as permutation locks. We'll see, probably unlikely. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk about how these guys work, and uh, let's see if we can figure out how many possible permutations or outcomes exist. How many different codes are there, right? So let's think about this. Let's think about these locks. I'm not going to redraw it. Actually, I can cheat here. Let's go like that. Add to a new page. There we go. So there's our permutation lock. The way that these work is that you need to have, for your code, your code is three numbers chosen from, typically we'll say 0 to 60. So three numbers chosen from 0 to 60, and then typically the way that the locking mechanism works is that the same number cannot occur twice. So that is like in our example back here, 63, 42, 5, we don't have the same number twice. 63, we can't have 63, 63, 63, right? That would not work. Well, we can work out then how many possible codes exist for this permutation lock. And actually, to start off, I don't even have to introduce a fun formula or anything like that. 
we can think about this strictly just using our multiplication formula that we looked at in the case of figuring out sandwiches, right? And that is we could say, okay, number of possible codes, we have three slots to fill, right? We have three numbers. And what we wanna do is we wanna say, okay, well, how many possible options exist for each one? Well, okay, first possible number can be anything between one and 60. So we have 60 possible values to choose from. Once we've chosen whatever that first value is, that's lost, it cannot be used again. So our second number has 59 possible numbers to choose from. And then finally our third number then has 58. So working through all that, what do we get? 60 times 59 times 58 gives us a total of 203,000, sorry, not 203,000, 205,320 possible codes. So quite a few, but maybe that's surprising that it's not as many as you might have first thought. So there's only 205,320 possible codes for these locks, which means that it's very likely that there's other locks out there with the same code as yours. Could you just go around and start trying and get the same one? Ah, uh, pretty unlikely. We can also solve permutations though using an actual formula. And let's take a look at our permutation formula. Our permutation formula, well, we actually have two of them. We have cases whether we have, I'm gonna go without replacement versus with replacement. And what do we mean by each case here? Well, without replacement means the same value cannot occur again. So that was like what we had here. As soon as a number was used, that number cannot appear again. So that is that number is not being replaced back in. With replacement, well, with replacement would mean that we could have that same number again. So we could have a code of 63, 63, 63. So a little bit different in each case, but of vital importance to keep in mind. Our formula for without replacement, the way that that guy is going to be typically presented is n p x, and that is going to be n factorial all over n minus x factorial. Where, okay, you're looking at this, bunch of questions. What's n? What's x? What's a factorial? Right? What's all these, this stuff going on? Well, okay, let's, let, let's discuss these. So n, n is our total choices, right? So total possible choices. That is right in our first example up here, we had 60 numbers that we could choose from. So n in this case would be 60. We were choosing 60, um, some number from 60. X is how many we're picking, right? So, okay, we have 60 possible numbers altogether. How many are we picking out of these 60 numbers? So, how many do we choose? Right, so in this case, we had an n of 60. In this case, we are picking out three. So we would say this would actually be a 60 permutate three, and we could work it out as 60 factorial all over 60 minus three factorial. Okay, this leads to the next one here. What is, what is a factorial? Well, a factorial is a mathematical operator, just like a plus sign, a minus sign, multiplication, division, anything like that. And what this is really just getting us to do is just to multiply, take the product, right? So to multiply numbers together, where we're gonna be decreasing by each whole number. So for example, if we had three factorial, that would be three times two times one. If we had five factorial, that'd be five times four times three times two times one. Right, so we could go through things in this kind of way. Finally, by definition, 
zero factorial, right? So you don't need to worry if you get zero in your denominator. Zero factorial by definition is one. So if you ever get that, you have one in your You'll also often typically have a function on your calculator that says NPX. Yes, this works. Yes, this is our permutation without replacement. This is our most common one that we will utilize. And typically, typically every calculator is different, but typically the way that you would use this is you would put in 60, you would hit this NPX button, you would hit your X, and then you would hit your, well, sometimes it'll just pop up. Other times you'll have to hit equals to get it to actually compute and calculate. So another way that we can do it. Otherwise, if we don't have this, well, we can either do it by hand, 60 times 59 times 58, on and on and on. Or often our calculators will also have a factorial button. Sometimes it shows up as this. Sometimes it shows up as that. So again, depending on your calculator, you're essentially looking for something with an exclamation mark, and that's your factorial button. Such that if we go in our calculator and go and hit 60 factorial, 60 factorial is going to work out to give us quite a good number. 8.32 times 10 to the power of 81. Right, so quite, quite a large number going on there. That's our scientific notation. If you're not familiar with scientific notation, what this means is that this decimal place has been moved 81 times. So if we wanted to get our actual number, we would have to move this decimal place back. One, two, three, four, right? 81 times back, and that would be our actual value. So quite a large number occurring in this case. To work this out then, what do we have? Well, we have, let's figure out number of possible permutations. So our 60 permutate three, that was 60 factorial all over 60 minus three, so all over 57 factorial. So if we work that out, that 67, sorry, it's not 67, 60 factorial divided by 57 factorial, and we get, lo and behold, no surprise, 205, 320, which, thankfully, exact same number we calculated up there. Why, why does this work? And this is actually a good little trick to know, because if you ever try on your calculator to do something like 70 factorial, most calculators out there will just report error. They won't be able to do it. Typically, 69 factorial is the highest that you can go. All right, that will give you a number any higher, and it just says, nope, we can't do that. Too much, not going to happen. So if that's the case, if we had 70 numbers up top here, how could we work this out? That is what would happen if we had 70 permutate 3. Right, so 70 factorial all over 70 minus 3 factorial, what would that be? 70 factorial all over 67 factorial? Uh-oh, 70 factorial doesn't work. Even if you try to trick your calculator and go, hey, 70 factorial divided by 67, it will still go error doesn't work. Well, okay, let's let's start breaking this apart. You're like, oh my goodness, this is going to be a nightmare to do all this by hand. Yeah, 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 it would, but we'll see that math section nice to us here. What would we have? 70, 69, don't worry, I'm not doing the whole thing. 68, 67, 66, on all the way down to 1. Okay, we would have all of this divided by 67 factorial, so... 67, 66, all the way down to 1. Hopefully this is popping out to you, our little trick here, because we're just multiplying everything. Hey, 67 cancels out 67, 66 to 66. All of this cancels each other out, meaning what are we left with? All we're left with is 70, 
69, and 68. Which if we think about it, this is back to our multiplication formula to say, okay, we had 70 available for our first number. We used one up, so 69 for the next, used one up, 68 for the last. That looks very, very similar, yeah, okay, for 70, but very, very similar to what we did up here to work out our permutations. So we see that our permutations do just collapse down to this in this case here. So nice little bonus for us. What about our other case? What happens if we're trying to do a permutation with replacement? That is, what if the same value could occur again and again and again? Well, this here is actually a bit easier to utilize. That would just be n p x such that that's just going to be n to the power of x. So, okay, not, not so bad there. Give an example of this guy. Well, let's suppose very simply that you created a five digit password of all lowercase letters. So if you wanted to create a five digit password of all lowercase letters, it could be the same letter five times, right? We can do it with replacement. Same letters could occur more than once. Five digit password, all lowercase, how many different passwords could we make? Well, how many letters do we have in the alphabet? Right, we have 26 letters in the alphabet. That's how many we're choosing from. So n is 26. And we want to pick out five of those. So 26 to the power of five, that's going to give us what? 11,881,376 possible passwords for you to create. And you're like, wow, that's that's a lot. Why do I have to do that whole at least eight characters, uppercase, lowercase, numbers, special characters, and everything else that go along with that? Well, because modern computing can work through 11 million, almost 12 million possible values fairly quickly, right? This is maybe a second. So in order to increase the complexity, increase the number of possible outcomes that could exist for your password, we introduce all these extra bits and we get an increasingly complex or an increasingly large number of possible outcomes. Makes it a lot tougher for a computer to get through. Okay, let's go back to our big bag of M&Ms. Let's suppose that again, okay, we have our big bag of M&Ms and we wanna reach in, and let's say that initially, initially, well, okay, this isn't actually a big bag of M&Ms. Initially, it's a bag of M&Ms with six M&Ms in it. And these six M&Ms, they are red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple. So, okay, we have six M&Ms, one red, one orange, one yellow, one green, one blue, one purple. We want to know that if you reach in without looking, right? So you reach in, you're just feeling around, and you grab three. And then you go, and from these three, you take a look, right? You have your hand. Uh, that's a rather short finger. There we go. Maybe that's a hand. You open up your hand, and you take a look, and boom, there we go. We have a red, uh, we have a blue, and we have a green. There we go. We have one possible outcome. What we're going to say in this case here, we're just reaching in, we're just observing which colors we have. We're not interested in the ordering of these colors at all. It's just, hey, what colors are in my hand, not which order do the colors fall in my hand. I want to know how many different combinations, right, how many different results I could have of different colors. So in this case here, that whole ordering doesn't matter. These are combinations. I just want to know how many different outcomes exist, irrespective of the ordering. That is, red, blue, green is going to be the same thing as blue, green, red. Same colors are there, same thing. Okay, so in this case here, for our combinations, we are going to be doing this again without replacement. 
So again, that is, hey, once I've picked out the red, the red is gone. I can't have two reds, right? In this case here, that's pretty clear. I only have one of each color. Or we can look at another case, which is going to be with replacement. So imagine this case here with replacement. I just have a large bag. I have a whole bunch of reds. I have a whole bunch of oranges, a whole bunch of yellows. That is, I could technically reach in and get red, red, red. I could get red, red, orange, right? I could get repeats in this case here. So the fact that I could get repeats, I have replacement occurring. But let's start off, let's start off taking a look at my combination formula without replacement. So combinations without replacement, I would have n combinate x, and n combinate x would work out to be n factorial all over x factorial n minus x factorial. So, okay, the n's mean the same thing as they did for our permutations. The x's mean the same thing as they did for the permutations. The factorial is, again, still just a factorial. Uh, my math's a little bit off. We need a bracket around that x, n minus x factorial. There we go. So if we wanted to work this out, how many different handfuls could I get? That is different colors in the handfuls. Well, okay, let's, let's go through that. What do I have for my n? I have six that I'm choosing from, right? Six possible choices that exist. I am picking out three. So, okay, let's keep the same kind of notation. X equals three, I'm picking out three values. So if I wanna work that guy out, what do I have? I'm gonna have six combinate three is going to be 6 factorial all over 3 factorial, 6 minus 3 factorial. So if we break that apart, what do we have? 6 factorial, 3 factorial, 3 factorial. So okay, let's, uh, let's do that bottom bit there first. That is 3 factorial times 3 factorial. I'm going to have 6 factorial all over 36. 6 factorial, what does that guy work out to? 720 over 36. So I get 6 combinate 3 to be 720 over 36, or I could pick out 20 different handfuls from this bag. Right? Again, such that the order does not matter but just different colors, different combinations. So 20 different ways that I could pull three different colors out of that bag. What about with replacement? What if I had a huge bag of M&Ms? So let's say still six colors, but I had 100 reds, 100 oranges, 100 yellows, right? On and on and on. Doing the same thing, reaching into that bag and just picking out three. I want to know, hey, how many different ones do I have in this case? Such that, again, with replacement, red, red, red could be an option. So how would I do that? Well, my combination formula with replacement, it looks a little bit uglier. N combinate X. This guy is going to be N plus X minus 1 factorial all over same denominator x factorial n minus x factorial so okay a little bit more to work through but honestly it's just an equation sorry that's an x not a y just an equation just putting numbers in and working it out so what do we have um we had n of we had six possible colors and we were picking out three so 6 plus 3 minus 1 factorial all over 3 factorial 6 minus 3 factorial. What does that give me? 6 plus 3 is 9, minus 1 is 8. So 8 factorial all over 3 factorial 3 factorial. I already know 3 factorial 3 factorial, that's 36. What's 8 factorial? Well, 8 factorial is 40,320. 
So how many different combinations do I have in this case? Well, 40,320 divided by 36 gives me 1,120. So strictly just by us being able to repeat the same value, that is I can pull out a handful of red, 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 orange, red, orange, red, I get a huge increase in my total number of outcomes that are possible, and I can work out a much larger total number of possible outcomes using my without replacement formula. So without replacement, sorry, mess that up. With replacement. This guy here was without replacement. Everyone has to be unique. I can have the same observation more than once. So two different ways to do it. Again, your calculator does have a function built into it. Again, most calculators have this function built into it. It's usually written as some button ncx. You use it in the same way as we use that n permutate x1. And again, what it's referring to is our without replacement. So if you ever want to use that combination function, that is what it's calculating. So you always have to make sure, hey, great, my calculator does stuff for me. You have to know what it's doing. Well, let's take a look at some examples. Okay, let's suppose that you are buying a new car. Ooh. So you are buying a new car. As part of the promotion that comes with the new car, you get to customize it a little bit. And that is you get to choose five. So you get to choose five kind of packages to put on it or little extra available options. So, right, these are things like um, you can pick any five of the 15. And these are things like air conditioning, power windows, right? I think most of this stuff is standard now on most new vehicles. Um, maybe you get like extra fancy paint. I don't know. Power seats, right? There's 15 possible little things that you can utilize to customize your car. What we want to work out is, okay, for this new car that you've bought, how many different versions of this car can you create? So you get to pick five options to add on out of 15 total. How many possible versions of this car can you create? Where do we start? Well, one of the first things we need to figure out is are we dealing with a combination or are we dealing with a permutation? Once we figure these guys out, we then need to ask ourselves, are we dealing in a without replacement or with a replacement scenario? Once we work that out, we can kind of narrow down what we're looking at and we know which formula to utilize to go forward with. So let's start off. Are we dealing with a permutation? That is, okay, permutation order matters. Does it matter if I add power windows first and then air conditioning? Is that going to be a different car if I picked air conditioning first and then power windows? No, right? In this case here, if I have air conditioning and power windows, it doesn't matter which one I picked first. It's the same car. So, okay, what am I doing in this case? I am dealing with a combination. So let's just circle that guy so we know where we're at. Now we need to work out, am I dealing without replacement or with replacement? That is, to, okay, to keep in mind what's happening, replacement, we could have the same thing more than once. Without replacement, ah, once you picked it, it's gone. Okay, if we kind of think about this in the context, does it make sense to pick air conditioning, air conditioning, air conditioning, and then power windows and new paint. Like, if we just picked air conditioning three times, do I get some kind of super air conditioning? No, right? That, it doesn't really make sense. As long as you have air conditioning, you have air conditioning. So 
once you pick power windows, you have power windows. Once you pick paint, right? You don't want to double up on these things. It does nothing for you. So in this case here, what are we dealing with? Are we dealing it with replacement or without replacement? Well, we are dealing without replacement. So, okay, we have a combination without replacement. What is that? That gives us N combinate X as, well, that's gonna be N factorial all over X factorial N minus X factorial. What do we have for each one? Well, we're going to have an n of 15. We're going to have an x of 5. So working that through, what are we going to have? About 15. That's going to give us a total of 3,003 different possible outcomes or versions of this car. Just by picking 5 from 15. Five different ways that we can do. So, okay, one kind of example that we can utilize to figure out our total number of outcomes. Let's take a look at another one. Oh, there we go. Let's take a look at another one in this case here. In this example, let's pretend that you are some kind of secret agent, some kind of spy, right? Some kind of James Bond movie. You need to break into this secret compound in order to stop the evil villain from launching a super laser that blows up the moon, something like this, right? In order to get into the secret compound, you have one of these keypads, right? We've all kind of seen these keypads in the movies, right? It's just kind of like your number pad. All right, so, okay, there we go. We have all of our different numbers, one, two, three, on, 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 and on. And we've seen this in the movies, right? The secret agent, he blows the powder on it and then notices, hey, a bunch of the numbers the powder sticks to, these are the ones that they're using. So, okay, you go and do that. And you blow your powder on it and you realize that the powder sticks to four, five, two, and six. Keep in mind that this isn't overly helpful on its own. You actually need to also know, well, how long is my password, right? How long is this code going to be? Well, luckily for us, we know that this code, right? We have intelligence. We have Intel saying that our code altogether was eight digits long. So our question, our mission, should we choose to accept it? is how many possible codes exist given that these four numbers are the ones that are utilized. Okay, so again, pause this, see if you can work this out, see if you can think your way through this. Good kind of place to start is again, break this apart. Is this a combination or is this a permutation? And do we have without replacement or are we dealing with replacement? Think through that. This will really help to kind of get you into which one we're looking at. Okay, so this is a passcode, right? Any good passcode is going to be a permutation such that something like 4526 is not the same as 6524, right? You don't just want to be able to mash these numbers and get some result. We want the order to be important. So we can see in this case that very clearly we're dealing with a permutation with replacement. And what we have is all together is we're going to be putting in this code, right? If you're like, oh no, okay, so permutation with replacement which one of these is my N? Which one of these is my X? Well, okay, let's think about it this way. We know that our code is eight digits long. That is, we have, ah, uh, sorry. We have eight slots to fill. Four, five, six, seven, and eight. There we go. So we have eight numbers that we need to put in. 
What we then have is, is our option for each of these slots that we are filling, four numbers. And because we have this with replacement, well, this value could be any of those four. This value could be any of those four. Any of those four, any of those four, on and on and on and on. That is, what do we just have here? Well, we have m permutate x such that this is n to the power of x. Well, we had four being worked through eight times, four to the power of eight. What does that give us? Well, that gives us 65,536 possible outcomes for us to consider. That is, if this was really your plan as a secret agent to break into this building to save the day, you're probably going to be sitting there for a while. Probably blowing dust on a keypad was not the best solution to your problem. Okay, this wraps up our counting rules. This uh, wraps up our introduction, our kind of basic definitions to probability. What we're going to be taking a look at next is actually calculating probabilities itself. We'll be taking a look at a few different rules of calculating probability and a few little tips and tricks and the like as we go through. So that will be in our next video.